Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. This is joint work with Eduardo Davila, who's at Yale, and Daniel Graves, who's also at Yale. It's a PhD student, and he's been a fantastic co-author. So we start with the observation that, like, you know, much of modern finance theory makes the assumption that there's lack of arbitrage opportunities. Right, but if in practice, the, we observe that there's a lot of deviations from the law of one price. In fact, there's a very active empirical literature that documents you know, deviations from CIP, uh, arbitrage opportunities in swap spreads, in ADRs, in dual listed stocks, and in many other asset classes. So when you think about this, there's a normative open question that's there. And it's basically, what is the cost, what's the social cost of having these arbitrage violations? Or what is the social value of closing these arbitrage gaps? So what we do in this paper is we develop a framework to understand the welfare cost of arbitrage violations. And with this framework, then we apply it to two different instances, one in the context of CIP, and then we look at dual listed stocks as well. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit of the results. The first result that we have characterizes the marginal social value of arbitrage. So basically what we do is we characterize what is the value in dollar terms of arbitraging one more unit. And what we find is that the value of this additional arbitrage trade is given by the arbitrage gap or the basis. Right? Now this is very helpful because now if we look at the existing evidence, it allows us to interpret it a little bit differently. Now when we see that you know, big gaps are there, you may have thought that those big gaps were associated with higher welfare costs, but we showed that that gap is exactly the value that you would get if you were to trade one more unit of the arbitrage trade. Okay. So now when you see fluctuations in basis, you can think of the marginal value of arbitrage fluctuating over time as well. Now, the second theoretical result that we have, and this is the one that actually allows us to pursue our empirical application, um, is telling us that we not only need the price, but we also need, or the, the, the marginal value, we also need to figure out how much do we need to trade to be able to close the gap to find what the total value of arbitrage is. And to do this, well, it's important to get actually price impacts. It's crucial to understand how does the price move when we trade one more unit of arbitrage, a second unit, a third unit, and so on. Okay. So price impact is going to be critical in our empirical estimations. Now our third result, and it's something that stems from, from the second one that I, that I just mentioned, it's um, linking liquidity in a market and liquidity interpreted as the price impact in a market or how much prices move when uh, an additional unit is traded. Um, it's linking this liquidity of the market to the value of the, the social value of arbitrage. So what we show is that keeping a an arbitrage gap constant, arbitrage uh, gaps are gonna be more costly in more liquid markets. And intuitively, it's very straightforward. You now if you think of, again, more liquid markets as those markets in which it's harder to move the price when you trade, then for the same arbitrage gap, we're gonna to need to trade more units in the liquid market to be able to close the gap. That means that the value of arbitrage is going to be higher than what it was in the illiquid market. So this is important because now, when we think of liquid markets, even if we have very small bases, we still have a chance of finding very big values of closing those gaps, right? Okay, so what we do with these results is we take them to two different applications. The first one is looking at the CIP case, uh, and then we look at dual listed stocks. I'm not gonna talk about dual listed stocks today. That's in the paper if everyone, anyone's interested. I'm going to go over the CIP case today. And in that case, we can go to CME, use CME data, which is very detailed, and measure price impact in the FX futures market directly. And what we find in that case is that the welfare gains do not exceed 300 million outside of the yen dollar. And this is just the max. On average, it's an order of magnitude smaller. And I'll show you all of the estimations by the, by the end of the talk. Now, uh, I'm gonna start with a very simple stylized model of segmented markets. 
And I'm going to develop my results on the marginal value of arbitrage and the total value of arbitrage in that model. Then in the paper, and I'm not going to show you that today, we extend this baseline model to allow for uncertainty for multiple periods who are having uh, many different investors, many different asset classes. And we show that what we capture in the baseline model is actually the direct cost of arbitrage. Okay? And that is what we're going to take to the data. And I'm going to show you the application to the CAP. Okay. So the model is very simple. We're going to have two periods, zero and one. There's no uncertainty. There's a, this is our single good economies. And we have two markets indexed by I, A and B. And in each of these markets, we're going to have a risk-free asset that's being traded. The risk-free assets are going to have the same payoff at time uh, date one. And the price is going to be PA in market A, PB in market B. Now we're going to have three groups of agents. We're going to have investors A, who can only trade in market A. We're going to have investors B, who can only trade in market B. And then we're going to have arbitrageurs that can trade in both markets. So, each type I investor is going to solve a consumption saving problem. It's going to maximize a certain utility UI that depends on consumption at day zero and consumption at date one by choosing the quantity that they buy in the risk of the risk free asset. Right? So, what are the constraints here? Just the budget constraints. Uh, at time zero, the agent is going to consume his endowment of the good at time zero. So, that's N zero I. And then it's going to have to pay for the amount it buys in the market of the risk-free asset, and then if it had any uh, holdings of the risk-free asset, those are going to be uh, sold in the market as well. Now, C1, well, that's going to be whatever the endowment the agent had, the investor had, uh, time one, and then it's going to get the dividends paid by the holdings of the risk-free asset. That's a pretty standard model. Um, we're going to assume, of course, that there's something different between these investors, like you know, and so that the prices are different in both markets, either preferences or, endow or endowments, something has to differ so that the price in A and the price in B are different and, and the, the analysis makes sense. Okay, so we're gonna assume without loss of generality that the price in B is greater than the price in A, right? So arbitrageurs who can trade in both markets, what they would like to do is just go buy cheaply in market A and then sell their expensive price in market B. Right. Now, an arbitrageur is going to have consumption that's given, well, I'm going to assume that arbitrageurs have no endowment at all, just for simplicity. And so the consumption of the arbitrageur at date zero, it's just going to be given by negative the cost of acquiring the risk-free assets in these two markets. By the way, this Q0 can be um, negative, and so therefore that consumption can be positive. Now at C1, at time, at time one, what is it that the arbitrageur is going to consume? It's just going to consume the dividends that are coming from the portfolio of risk-free assets that it bought at day zero. Okay. Now let me write this a little bit differently. I'm going to just take the Q0 A alpha out. So this is basically Q0 is the amount that the arbitrageur buys in asset in market A. Right. So now I'm left with these two terms, the blue and the orange term. For each unit, the orange term is telling me that for each unit of the asset that the arbitrageur buys in market A, it has to buy Q0B alpha over Q0A alpha in market B. So why is this helpful? Because now I can basically think of the arbitrage strategy for the arbitrageur as follows. I can think of the amount that the arbitrageur buys in market A as the scale of the trade, and I can think of the amount that it needs to buy in market B relative to the amount that it buys in, he, he buys in market A as the, the direction of the trade, right? So now to characterize an arbitrary trade, the only, need that I, the only thing that I need to impose is that the consumption at date one is going to be zero. I can do that, and you may have figured this out already. This is a very simple and stylized model. The direction of the trade is going to be minus one. For each unit that the arbitrageur buys in A, it has to sell one in B. Now, this is very simple in, the two, in, in this very stylized model. When you go and do it in the general model, it's very helpful and useful to think in these terms. Now, assume that the arbitrageurs are risk neutral, just for illustration. Then the arbitrageur's utility is just going to be given by his consumption at date zero. It's just going to be given by the profit that the arbitrageur makes from the arbitrage trade. Right? 
And notice that this is not an indirect utility. I'm not allowing the arbitrageur to maximize anything. And actually, I'm not going to allow the arbitrageurs to maximize anything in everything that I do. So that's actually an important distinction. We're going to make no assumptions on the behavior of the arbitrageurs, unlike any, many other papers that deal with arbitrage. We're going to take actually the scale of the arbitrage trade as a primitive in our model. We're going to just take that amount of arbitrage that's being done as a given. Right? So you can think of different frictions mapping to different levels of arbitrage in an economy. And you can think of relaxing frictions as just increasing the amount of arbitrage that's made and tighten frictions as redu reducing that end. Okay? And we have a lot of micro foundations in the appendix. We think of trading costs, strategic trading, short sales with borrowing constraints, collateral constraints, to kind of show how to maximize this. But we're not going to take a stand on, on what the friction behind the gap existing is. We're just going to be completely agnostic about that. So now we're going to take the amount of arbitrage M as a primitive. So we're going to characterize an equilibrium. We're going to define an equilibrium as a function of this amount of arbitrage that's being done. So we're going to think of an arbitrage equilibrium, which is going to be parameterized again by this scale of the arbitrage trait M, by a set of allocations and prices, which are going to depend on M, uh, such that investors are going to maximize their utility and that markets are just going to clear. So basically, the market clearing conditions are telling me that whatever the arbitrageur buys in market A is the change in the position of investors in market A and the same thing in market B. Whatever the arbitrageur sells in market B has to be equal to the change in the position for um, investors in market B. Okay. Now, I want to add a few remarks here. So why are we doing it this way? Well, we're doing it this way because this is allowing us to move from autarky to full integration. So basically moving from having an arbitrage gap to a case in which the arbitrage gap disappeared smoothly. Right? We're going to think of an autarky equilibrium of one like M has, is equal to zero. And the integrated equilibrium is going to be one which both prices are equal and then the amount of arbitrage trade is going to be equal to M star, which is what we refer to as a gap closing trade. And what we have in mind, the reason why we do it this way, is because what we have in mind is something very similar to the literature on the cost of business cycles. Like you can think of Lucas 87 or others, Yearman, um, 2004. So the idea there is, well, suppose that we could get, just, get rid of the business cycles and keep everything else in the economy the same. What would be the value of doing that? And that's something very similar to our hypothetical experiment. What we're saying is, like, suppose that we could keep, uh, we could close the gap. What would be the value of doing that? Right? By the way, if the friction that it's creating the gap only enters in the utility of the agents in the economy through prices, we're capturing the whole effect. There's nothing that we're, we're missing. In a well-behaved model, we should expect that the more the arbitrageur buys in A, the higher the price is, and the more that it sells in B, the lower the price is there. So this is what we're going to assume. Uh, going forward. We're going to take into account the price impact of the arbitrageur, and that's going to be crucial for us. Okay, so we can show you now uh, the first result. What we show is that the marginal value of arbitrage is given by this expression over here. So let me just explain to you what, what is it that I have. So this expression over here is the marginal value for an investor A of one additional unit of arbitrage M and that's normalized by the marginal utility of consumption at date zero of the investor A. So this is in money metric terms. This is measured in dollars. Right? So I have the same thing for investor B and the same thing for the arbitrageur. You know, if the arbitrageur is risk neutral, then that is just going to be one. OK, so what is this? What is the marginal value of an investor in A of an additional unit traded by the arbitrageur? Well, that is going to be given by the blue terms there. First, the investors are going to be selling M. That's the change in their position. That's how much they're going to be giving the arbitrageur. And they're going to be getting the price, the change in the price. So they're going to be selling much more expensively than they were before because the arbitrageur is driving the price up. So that's a good thing for them. On the other hand, we have investors in B. Well, they're buying, and they're buying more cheaply than they were before. So they're also happier about the arbitrageur increasing M. No. Now, what happens with the arbitrageur? Well, the arbitrageur takes into account that he's moving the price against him. So these are the blue terms here. But at the same time, he's pocketing 
the price differential the basis, right? So now when I think of the marginal social value of arbitrage, I can just add up all of these terms because they're all measured in US dollars. So what I get is that the only term that survives is the red term. So the red term is the direct effect, and all of the blue terms are distributed pecuniary externalities that cancel out. So now, with this result, I know that the arbitrage gap is giving us the marginal social value of arbitrage. Now, this is very helpful because now I can go and try to compute what the total social value of arbitrage is. All right, so I know what the marginal is. I can just use the fundamental theorem of calculus, basically integrate over that and try to get what it is. So it's going to be the integration over all of the gaps along the curve. Now, what is that? Well, to, be able to be actually be able to compute this total social value of arbitrage, what I need to do is I need to know, of course, the initial gap, and I also need to know measures of price impact to figure out how those gaps evolve as the gap is being closed, as more arbitrage is happening, right? So let me just show it to you graphically. This is the idea. What I have here is on the x-axis, on the x-axis, I have the amount of arbitrage that's being done. Uh, on the y-axis, I have the prices, A and B. And this curve is just basically telling us the willingness to pay, of each, uh, sorry, the, how the price evolves over um, in each of these markets as the amount of arbitrage is changing, okay? So we start with M0, and I showed you in my first proposition that the marginal value, so the, the, the social value of that, is just the difference between these two lines, PB and PA. Now, the additional unit that the arbitrator trades is going to be the difference between those two curves. So you keep on doing that until you close the gap, you're gonna have all of that shaded area. That's kind of the idea. So all of that shaded area measures exactly all of these arbitrage gaps, and this is kind of like a connection for, to the Hardberger triangle, like we're creating some surplus all along it's not really the same thing because we don't have willingness to pay here. We, ha we don't have demand curves. We just have how the price changes in equilibrium uh, as the amount of arbitrage changes. Okay, so this gets me to my third theoretical result that I told you about. I'm gonna define liquid markets are markets with small price impacts in which like, prices move very slowly. I'm gonna think of illiquid markets as those markets in which one unit of trade moves the price a lot. Um, so now, if I keep the arbitrage gap constant, the social value of arbitrage is going to be higher in more liquid markets and it's going to be lower in more illiquid markets. And again, the intuition is that large gaps in illiquid markets are easy to close. So let me give you the same picture that I had before. Suppose that this is one market, and I have the gap being you know, P0B minus P0A. And let me think of the same initial gap in a market that is much more liquid. So that means that the curves are going to be flatter, right? So you can clearly see that conditioning on, conditioning on the, first, the, the same initial gap, it takes much, many more units to close the gap in the market that is more liquid, and therefore the shaded area is going to be larger. Okay. So how much time I've got? Good. Okay. <laughs> you some, some time. Okay, good. I have 11 and a half minutes. That's good. Okay, so now with this result in mind, let me just go to the empirical application then. So we're going to start, like the only one that I'm going to show you today is the CIP application. Everything else uh, that we do for dual listed stocks is in the paper if you're interested. So we're starting, like, you know, this is just a replication of Adrian's paper, which is showing the CIP deviations. You can see like zero to minus 140 for the yellow line, which is the Japan, the, the yen um, dollar pair. And you can see that it fluctuates a lot. You can see that, you know, sometimes it's very close to zero, sometimes above zero, sometimes below zero, and it spikes at certain times. I just want you to pay attention to that, you know, spike in 2008 and the spike here in 2020. So it seems to be that the bases are larger in times of distress, right? But this is clearly telling us that there's a deviation from the law of one price. And what we're gonna to try to figure out is like using our model is, well, how costly it is to actually have these deviations. So 
we can adapt our methodology and to the CIP case. And then we get that the marginal value of one unit arbitrage of, of arbitrage trade in that market is going to be given by this expression over here where SM is the spot price, F is the futures price, and then RFM and RDM are just the interest rates in the domestic and foreign countries. Right, so the idea here is you borrow in dollars, you go and convert dollars into euros, for example, then you go lend, lend the euros, and then you close the lag by just buying dollars in the future, right, when you are paid. So what we need then to compute our statistic is the arbitrage gap or the basis, which is easy to measure, which is go to Bloomberg and get it. The harder thing to get is the price impact, and that's substantially harder to get. Right, and that's where most of our empirical work is going in. What are we going to do to get this? Well, we're going to estimate the price impacts in the FX futures market, then we're gonna extrapolate that to the spot market, and we're gonna assume that the bond's price impact is zero. So meaning that when we think of these trades that are gonna close the CIP deviations, we're not changing the interest rates in the domestic and foreign countries. That's our assumption. Why are we doing it this way? Well, we're using it this way because we have very good data for the ex futures market. You know, it's very transparent. We get a lot of data that allows us to actually uh, estimate the price impacts. And all of the results that, we're going, that I'm going to show you are designed to actually give you an upper bound on the welfare losses. So at every point in time when we have to make an assumption, we'll try to make these estimates bigger. That's, that's kind of what we're doing. And the other thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna study each of these deviations pairwise, right? I'm gonna think that everything else is, if I'm studying you know, the euro dollar deviation, the pair, then I'm gonna keep everything else constant, okay? So what do we do exactly? We're gonna be thinking of three month CIP. Data is coming from CME, so we have top books and trade data. We have every transaction, bid change and offer change recorded within a millisecond of timestamp. Period we have, that we're doing is from December 2019 to um, February 2021. 20, and <clears throat> the way in which we're gonna estimate the price impact is we're gonna follow the literature a little bit and go with a power law estimation, right? So we're gonna be thinking of the following functional form. Um, this F tau plus one is the weighted average of a bid and ask, so it's the midpoint of a transaction tau plus one. This one here is the midpoint of the transaction that happened before. So this is not time. The tau is not indexing time, it's just indexing the transactions that happen sequentially. Right? So now we have the change in the midpoint, transaction by transaction, and then we have this Q tau over here is going to be the quantity traded in transaction tau, right? So the idea is here is that if you, trade, if you started with a midpoint of F tau and then you traded Q tau at the price, you're gonna end up with F tau plus one, right? Now this alpha here, it's going to measure the price impact. How much does the midpoint change when the quantity traded is changing, right? And this beta, we're gonna, for what I'm gonna show you today, that's going to be fixed at one half, but we're also doing not in, in, the, in the appendix in the paper, we do it non-linearly and estimate that beta as well. Okay. So this is what we, we, what we get. You know, we have estimates of the price impacts. You can see they're a little bit all over the place, they change over time, but what's interesting is look at when they spike. This is again from 2020, this is just 2020 to 2021, but if you look at it, there's a spike around COVID, which shouldn't be very surprising, right? Because that's markets liquidity dried up. So, but this is also the time where we had the biggest deviations in CIP, right? So in fact, if you actually look at the co-movement between price impact and CIP deviations, you see that uh, so, sorry, this, like the deviation is larger going down in the y-axis, and here we have how illiquid the markets are. So the markets are more illiquid, the larger the deviations are. So that's basically telling us that when it's really valuable 
to close an arbitrage gap, it's really easy to do it, right? Or put differently, when you have you know, very small deviations, those are harder to close, so maybe it doesn't matter so much. Okay, so this is just for, um, th this is true for all of the currencies that we do. This is for the euro dollar, but we have that we replicate the same fact for the Arab currency pairs that, that we observe. Okay, so why is this important? Because now when you see the results that I'm gonna show you next, you shouldn't be too surprised. Like, you know, remember that when we saw the CIP deviations, sometimes they were substantial, but many times they were just very close to zero. Now what I'm telling you is that when they were very close to zero, well, they were also very, like, you know, it, it, didn't, it doesn't matter really how much you have to trade because you're basically making nothing for them. But when they were substantial, the gaps were very easy to close. So we shouldn't expect to get big numbers in our com computations of the cost of, of those deviations. Now, what do we get in the price impact here? These are just the magnitudes that we get. It's basically, you know, for the euro case, you trade 10 billion traded there are gonna move the futures rate by 0.15%. Okay. And all of this extrapolation is made based on beta equals one half. In the appendix, we do a lot of robustness with respect to this number. Okay, what are the welfare gains then? These are the welfare gains. So the yellow one is the Japan yen dollar pair. I just want you to kind of forget about that one. There's a lot of other things that are happening in that case. And uh, we get pretty exorbitant, like differences of, in an order of magnitude with respect to the other pairs. Um, they never exceed, if you want to include the yellow line, the 1.2 billion. But if you just focus on all of the other lines, so for the Australian dollar, the pound, the Canadian dollar, and the euro, in those cases, they never exceed $300 million. And also, on average, they are an order of magnitude smaller, so around like 30 million. Right? Now, I think that this is, whether you think that this is big or small, it depends basically on what you want to compare it for it with. If you think of the daily volume in the spot futures um, foreign exchange market, that's just 416 billion, right? So whether you think that the third 300 million or 30 million is big or not, again, it's depend. I leave it to you to, to decide. Now, I want to clarify something. The number that I'm giving you is the value of closing the gap today and you're not taking into account what's the value of everything that can happen in the future. When I said that when we went to the model, you know, in the general model, what we're gonna get is the direct cost that I showed you in the simple model, and then you're gonna get a lot of distributed pecuniary externalities that are gonna arise from changes in positions in the future. Those are things that we are not capturing. So it's not okay to say, oh, wait, then if I have like 30 million each day, I'm gonna add up all of the 30 minutes to take, take the present value of that, and that's the value of closing the arbitrage gap. That's not what we're saying, okay? So if you close it today, you generate 30 million, and then what happens in the future depends a lot of how the distributive expert externalities, distributed PKU externalities evolve. Okay, probably have like one minute, and I just wanna show you the gap closing traits. They are very big uh, in, in the yen case at the very beginning of 2020. They're not so big otherwise, they're around 450 billion. On average, they're much, 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 much smaller. And they're kind of in line in terms of magnitudes with what the Fed offered in when, when COVID hit to the banks to actually close the CIP deviations. So that's kind of like a sanity check for estimates. It kind of, it's, it's good that they're in the same order of magnitude. Okay, so let me conclude. I showed you a framework to compute the value of arbitrage. I showed you how to get the marginal and aggregate social values of arbitrage. Um, it's critical to have good measures of liquidity to be able to get to our, the measures um, that I showed you. And in the CIP application, you know, we find that CIP welfare losses are moderate despite taking places in very liquid markets due to the correlation uh, between the gaps and the illiquidity of the market. So there's much more in the paper. We extend this to production. We have many different um, Ex extensions to, to, to our analysis, and uh, if you want to talk, I'll be very happy to do that later. Thank you. <laughs>